Thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming to my talk, uh, the human side of GraphQL. And no, it's not a spelling mistake, that is how we spell human. Um, it's been great to see loads of you over the last day or so. I recognize quite a few faces I've spoken to. This morning, my voice was really struggling. I don't think I've used it that much in quite a while. Um, and if you haven't already come to speak to us, please do. We have a stand on one, one side. We've got Lego cars to give away. Um, so yeah, come have a chat. Um, so yeah, Robbie, I'm the lead cloud software engineer at Human. Um, I've been there two and a half years now, uh, from when it started very small. And okay, first of all, I just want to clarify what kind of we mean by cloud engineers, because I think that term gets used a lot for a lot of different things. And our team is essentially building services, uh, service functions and stuff like that, targeting cloud platforms. And so we're, we're basically a team of Go engineers, predominantly Rick and Go, a bit of other stuff as well. Um, yeah, um, so I guess really standard software engineers. And we're hiring. So if any of this interests you, um, yeah, check us out. And yeah, I've been using Go for a while since 2013. Um, so what am I going to talk to you about today? Well, GraphQL, as you might have guessed. Um, but really more specifically, kind of our journey with GraphQL, um, how we're using it at Human. Um, and I really hope like, the people that don't or haven't used GraphQL before will get a bit of a flavor of what it is. And maybe if you're, you know a bit more about it and are thinking you use it in your systems, you might get kind of learn from what we've done and maybe some of the mistakes we've made that I'm going to go through along the way and hopefully then can make a decision about whether you really want to. So I'll start off with a short introduction to human, um, kind of who we are, what we do, add a bit of color. Um, and then I'm going to a bit of an introduction about GraphQL. I assume there's some people that haven't used it out there. Talk about how it fits into our infrastructure, how we're using it, and also why we chose it, most importantly. And then we're going to dig into a bit of code, Go code, kind of why we're all here, really. Um, look at how we interact with GraphQL from Go, um, some of the challenges we faced, uh, some of the mistakes we made, and then currently how we're trying to overcome those. Uh, there's quite a few code snippets as we go. If you really want to see the full snippets, I've often shot them down. There's a GitHub repo you can go check out. So, who are human? Um, we are a European based insure tech company. Um, been kind of going a few years now, VC funded and things like that. Um, been selling our product for a couple of years. Essentially, our product uh, is targeting commercial vehicle fleets. We take telematic data. Uh, you've probably heard it, it's black boxes. We consume that data in real time. We analyze it through a whole bunch of risk models that our data science team have come up with and basically price every trip that a vehicle makes in real time and on how well that trip was driven. And therefore, we can offer deductions or potentially penalties on the insurance premium. Um, and hopefully also feed that back into the fleets and the drivers so they can improve the way they drive, improve the safety, imp and therefore drop their premium, but also make the roads safer for us all. Um, if you were one of our customers, you'd probably interact with our product like on a screen like this. Um, the top, it shows what we call a fleet safety score. It's kind of a value between 100 of how safe we believe that fleet is. Um, you can see the premium we're charging you and how much discount you're currently getting for that safety score. You can see how that safety score has varied over time and how we feel you could improve your, or your drivers could improve to increase that safety score in them for get more discount. It's also a good example of how we're using GraphQL as these, the information on that page is being collected from many different database tables different, from different types of sourcing and things like that and a very few number of queries to obtain the data, making a nice reactive experience for the user. But we're not a front-end conference, so won't go any more into that for now. So let me talk to you about GraphQL. Can I have a show of hands to who has used GraphQL before? Great, a few of you. Um, enough there that haven't, that hopefully this next few slides are worth doing. A bit for those that have, um, feel free to find any mistakes I've made. Um, so, what, GraphQL, what do they advertise GraphQL being? Well, these are some of the key points at GraphQL, if you check out their documentation, highly recommend doing it. I think it is generally pretty good of what GraphQL gives you. It's a query language for your APIs, essentially. Um, I think it's quite a nice one, but it's a nice way of expressing the data that you want to retrieve from your server back to your clients and doing it in a way 
where you can kind of describe the complex interactions that might happen between your different database objects and retrieve data that all is interrelated with hopefully a minimal number of requests to your databases. It is not tied to any database or storage backend, though you may find, as we have, sometimes it's quite hard for the behaviors of those backends not to creep forward into your client code. Um, Pagination is always a tricky one, that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it provides a type system, so and kind of all the benefits and problems that a type system brings. Data integ integrity, if that's important to you, it's really useful for. But at the same time, you lose some of the flexibility. And finally, it's agnostic to the transport layer. Um, you'll probably find a lot of GraphQL interactions and descriptions are over HTTP, but there's no reason you can do it over whatever transport mechanism you, you really want. Um, in our case, it is HTTP. And again, if you want to uh, check out any documentation, I'd recommend it. To start with, when you're dealing with GraphQL, probably the first thing you're going to want to deal with is a schema. A schema is the central point that any engineers, any services are going to have to interact with. And getting your schema right is kind of an essential thing that you, you and your services will need to do to kind of streamline and make it as efficient as possible to access the data that you need to. Um, here's an example of a very simple schema. Uh, we have three types defined by the type keyword, a vehicle, a driver, and a trip. Um, and we can see, for instance, the vehicle has three fields, the reg, the make, the odometer, or the mileage reading, um, and they have associated types, string, string, int. Uh, the driver has a, a name field, a string, and the trip, probably the more interesting one, has a distance field, an integer, but also has two fields, the vehicle and driver, which have the type, the two types we've defined above, the vehicle and driver, instantly kind of telling us that there is a link there, and that potentially we could obtain the vehicle and the driver information along with our trip information. So GraphQL itself um, provides some basic types, as you would expect in any kind of language. Um, you have some scalar types, int, float, string, boolean, id, which is kind of a special string. And you have some more complex types, lists, enums, interfaces, and unions. Um, it also has a kind of additional thing in here. You can define required or optional types. Um, using the exclamation operator. And this is quite useful when you potentially have primary keys or something on the database that you always want to include within that piece of data. So in this case, on our vehicle, we might want to make the reg primary key in whatever data store we're putting it in, and therefore we can make that a required field. There are then two special types, um, the query and the mutation. Uh, queries, you might guess, is the way we obtain information from our GraphQL servers and database backends. And mutations are the way we can create update, delete data as well. They are essentially the entry points into the server from any external clients. And within your schema, you're likely to define any queries or mutations that you want to be allowable within or on any of your data. And next few slides, we're just going to dig into those in a bit more detail. So here's an example of a GraphQL query. As we said, it's how we obtain data. Um, we have query keyword, defining we want to make a query. We then have the operation we want to perform. In this case, we're going to perform get vehicle. We're going to, it kind of has that function signature style uh, syntax to it. We're going to provide the reg as an argument, this time hard coded to go for one. And we're going to ask for two fields back, the make and the odometer. Um, we get a response, JSON encoded, and it has a very defined structure. So we have a data field at the top level, Within that, we have the name of the operation we performed on the server. And within that, we then have the fields that we asked for and only the fields that we asked for. At the top level, you also have a potential another field, which is the errors, which is a list of potential errors that happened during implementing these requests on the server. This is how GraphQL itself is going to communicate the errors. It means that you don't necessarily, or you're not going to get an HTTP response code 400, 500, or whatever. It's all going to be encapsulated in there and not propagated up to the transport layer. So what about a more complex example? So let's say our schema also had the ability to list all the trips we want that have been made. Um, an example of that, we're on the left-hand side. Again, we have the query keyword, we have the list trips operation, and then we have a new keyword, items. This is effectively telling the server we want a list back. We can then pick out the fields that we defined earlier, so we want a distance field. And this time, we're also going to ask for the vehicle and the driver that made that trip. And we can select what fields within those two objects that we want to be returned as well. On the right-hand side, you can see kind of a response that we might expect. It's returned us a list of one. 
Again, we have the data, we have the operation we performed, we have a new items field, which is defined as a list, and in that, all the possible items. And we can see there, it's GraphQL has performed the operations to go and get the vehicle and the driver information as well as the trip. Those three things could have been a completely different databases, different database technologies even. We've pushed that complexity out of our clients into the server. Doesn't mean necessarily, if you also control the server, it's not gone away, but it might now just be in a single place. Mutations. So mutations, as I said, how we create data. Um, again, they have a very similar syntax to our queries. We, we have a mutation keyword, we have the operation. We pass the arguments to, uh, to the operation that we want to create the vehicle in, and we can ask back for any of the fields that in the vehicle object that we want, really. So in this case, we just got asked for the reg back. And again, we have a response, exactly the same structure as we've already seen. Anything can great. Well, yeah, this is how GraphQL looks, but how would I actually make a request to a GraphQL server to, make, to perform that operation? Well, in our case, and I think a lot of cases, you're probably going to be doing this over HTTP. And an example of a basic HTTP request would look something like this. Anyone made a curl request is going to recognize the stuff at the top. You've got a URL, you've got a method, you've got some headers. Um, it's then in the body, really where the GraphQL stuff starts. We're introducing an extra layer here. So we're expecting a JSON encoded body. And the first field, and probably the only required field that it's going to expect, is a query key, which is defined as a string. And effectively, it's a string representation of the queries and mutations we've just been through in the last few slides. Um, so there, we can see the mutation from the last slide. We could run that HTTP request. We'd expect a 200 response back and the adjacent encoded response body with maybe errors, maybe data, depending what happened. And it's, you're probably thinking, like, great, well, do, am I going to have to like fump sprint f these strings or things like that every time I want to insert dynamic data because you've hard coded in here? The answer is no. Luckily, GraphQL provides a method for us to do this. Um, and that comes in the form of configurable variables via a variable block. So taking a step back to our mutation, we've now on the left-hand side defined a new block, a variable block, where we can define the variables we want to insert dynamically, and we define their types. We can then, in our operation, we can map the variables onto the particular field that we want to associate them with. And then in the body of our request on the right-hand side, we can now, at the top level of that JSON structure, introduce the new variables uh, key, which is going to be a JSON map. And we can dynamically put in there whatever variables we want. And when we send that to the GraphQL server, it's going to perform the complexity of inserting those into the, the query string to then that can then be run as a GraphQL query and fetch whatever data or put whatever data we want onto the backend servers. So that was a quick introduction to GraphQL. I'm sure I've missed out lots of stuff, so I'm sure any GraphQL experts in the room will tell me. But hopefully, for anyone that hasn't, there's enough basics here for the rest of the slides to make sense. Uh, we've been over what it offers as a query language, how we can build a schema to define our data, how we can interact with that via queries and mutations, and then finally, how we can actually make that over a transport mechanism like HTTP. Um, I'm next here to talk about how we use GraphQL at Human. So this is a simplified diagram of, very simplified, of Human's architecture. On the left-hand side, we are consuming our telematic data from our vehicles. Um, this comes in, well, it comes out the, the vehicles over the mobile network, goes to a set of providers which we integrate with and it will come to us in an absolute all over the place for a set of data, whatever transport mechanism you can think of. We ingest that into a Kubernetes cluster. We have a lot of stream processing going on. Um, we use Apache Flink. Um, we have a team that a kind of dedicated team for dealing with that, for processing the very raw data and mapping it onto kind of more usable stuff um, further on in the pipe pipeline. And that's really where the Go stuff kicks in. Um, we have a set of Go microservices, which implement a lot of our data science models uh, and pricing engines, do a lot of third-party integrations. But along all of that, they, at various points, so a lot of that communication is happening over Kafka, in fact, all of it is. Um, we want to make a decision about whether we want to store data or whether we want to query for data to enrich the stuff we're currently processing. And all of that happens via GraphQL. Um, our main data backends are um, OpenSearch, Elasticsearch, um, and DynamoDB. Um, 
as you probably get from that, we are running on AWS, fully tied into that kind of ecosystem. Um, and we also use a tool called Apache Kylin for data aggregations, um, sitting on top of all of that. Um, uh, so all of those are accessible and really only accessible via GraphQL. Our front end, as we saw earlier, talks almost completely via GraphQL to all of that. And then we have a whole set of lambdas which we use for ad hoc processing tasks, onboarding new vehicles, drivers, fleets onto the system, sort of stuff you'd expect lambdas to be doing. Again, everything happens via GraphQL. So it's really key to our architecture, and therefore the GraphQL server is really something that we've had to put a lot of time and a lot of effort into to, to looking at. But we haven't implemented one ourselves. Um, and don't worry, this isn't going to get into an AWS sales pitch. Um, <laughs> We, we use AppSync. Uh, you might have come across it, might not, but essentially it's a fully managed GraphQL server. Um, you basically create resolvers, as they call them, which are um, is a language called Velocity Tempaking Language to map GraphQL queries onto the database backends. It supports like, their own databases as first class citizens and whatever other custom stuff you could possibly want to put behind it. Um, so the complexity hasn't gone away. We still have to kind of deal with our data, but it is all in one place, and for all our teams, they can collaborate at one place and keep their own clients very simple and spend more time focusing on the business logic in the clients rather than with trying to deal with their database backends. So why GraphQL? A few of the reasons, probably more. Um, so it provides an interface like data access. Um, I guess what we mean by this is it takes a lot, of, well, kind of what I've just alluded to, it takes a lot of that complexity out of the clients and defines a nice, simple interface that we don't care, hopefully, what, whether it's in OpenSearch, DynamoDB, coming out of Apache Kylin or a Lambda, we can just make that GraphQL request and get the data back we asked for when we're writing our Go code, which is really good. Same for the Scala, the TypeScript guys, all of that. It all just happens exactly the same way. It's easiest for us all as engineers to rationalize about and build up that, that schema to make it as optimal as possible. Um, it keeps like, the, mod, the clients and the data quite loosely coupled. Um, we did show there were some required fields for database keys and stuff like that. That's kind of unavoidable. But we can add fields, we can add data in, and we don't have to go and update all our clients because optional fields, it just happens. So you can update the clients that you only need to until maybe you have the opportunity to go around and, and, ch and change things if you, if you need. Um, said, it's consistent across all our languages. Um, and the strong typing, we feel it offers a lot. We want that data integrity. If you try and make insert data that doesn't match the type the scheme is expecting, you're going to get an error back and it's not going to let you happen, which then stops any issues happening later downstream when you try and query it, et cetera. And it also provides, and especially AppSync itself, uh, provides a lot of data access controls down to even the field level within these objects um, using directives. So it keeps the security guys happy. We can limit access for different customers or even engineers within there to not pick out, say, personal data and things if, if they don't have uh, kind of the access levels to do so. But what considerations need to make? Um, the Go client support can be a bit light. Um, I think when people tend to think of Go, we obviously tend to think of the, the server side. Obviously, we all know here, Go is much better than that and can be used for a lot, lot more. But if you look at a lot of the open source libraries and things like that for GraphQL, the majority of the focus is going to be on the server side. If they're assuming you're probably going to be implementing a GraphQL server backend, which is fine. Perfectly good for doing that. Um, the client side, I'm actually kind of there are some good stuff out there. I'll go come on to one at the end of this, but it, it did at the time feel a bit light. Um, performance can be an issue. Uh, it, you get increased latency. We do have a very hot code path, of data path for our system where GraphQL was becoming a real bottleneck and we had to write directly to the backend data store, being open search. Um, I would think for most, for 99% of what we do, it's absolutely fine, but it is a consideration if you are writing lots of data, things like that, it tan out of that overhead. Um, again, with any open kind of like uh, blah, 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 cloud provider or cloud service, sometimes debugging problems can be fun. Um, if anyone's dealt with AppSync, the velocity templating can be horrible at times. Um, and testing, I won't go into too much that now because there's actually quite a few slides dedicated to this in a bit. But we, yeah, it's one of the trickiest things we've actually found is 
adequately testing what we, the um, GraphQL stuff we do. And probably not really limited just to GraphQL, but managing breaking changes, deploying them at the server side, and managing that with all your clients is, is tricky. And it's hard to fully automate, um, really uh, kind of buy into continuous deployment kind of approaches, but it often breaks when we hit that point, um, and therefore engineers have to get involved. So that's some of the, the pros and cons, why we chose it. Um, I'm sure you can argue either way, right choice, wrong choice, but yeah, that's where we're at. So let's get on to the good stuff. GraphQL and Go, uh, while we're here. Uh, go go over a few things in the next couple of slides. How to write a simple GraphQL client for those that haven't seen it before, haven't used GraphQL. Um, how we kind of started with that, the naive approach, and then kind of improved that on that into a package. And we're then going to point out all the mistakes we made when we wrote that package the first time, and go on to the kind of journey we're currently on at the moment, which is trying to make that package better, and yeah, where, where we're at, really. So, bit of Go code. Um, if you go onto the internet and look, kind of look up GraphQL and Go, you're probably going to see some code that looks a little bit like this. You're going to see some form of constant which represents your query string that you want to run. Um, as you see, we're using the variables block we looked at earlier to substitute variables in. You're probably going to see some form of struct which represents the high-level uh, kind of request you're going to make over HTTP with the query block, the variables block. We yeah have a nice map string interface code smell in there, um, and yeah, your query strings defined as a string. It, you, you'll probably see that, that sort of stuff all over in any tutorials. And if you write a Go function to do that, apply this, create vehicle, we're taking a reg as uh, an argument, and we're going to populate our request structure. We're going to marshal it into JSON, and we're going to send it over HTTP. And I should pause here and say, don't do what I've done. Please handle your errors. Um, and, but there's also a whole load of other stuff I've missed off there in terms of dealing with the response, checking the errors field, all that kind of stuff. Just You don't want to have to sit there and look through a few sides of that. But we start off with that kind of code in a whole host of different clients. Um, and there's quite a few problems with this. Uh, updating schemas, if there were breaking changes, meant we had to go and update code in lots of different clients. And we found that a lot of clients that were doing similar sort of queries actually kind of had the same query string, and therefore that they got duplicated in a lot of places, and they're quite error prone. We're going to come on to that more as well. Um, we also have a lot of duplicated oh, sorry, it off. Um, HTTP boilerplate, we've kind of seen here, and I've skipped a lot of it, but handling those request responses, and yeah, you can refactor into functions, but existing that on all your clients, chances for bugs, a lot of copy-paste and things like that, um, and they did happen. And it, finally, the testing as well. So a lot of, you'd find there was a lot of boilerplate within our testing, which was more about kind of like handling the HTTP calls or writing mocks and stuff like that, and not really allowing you to focus on testing the, the business logic, which is what you really want your unit test to do. So we came up with an idea of refactoring as much as we could into a GraphQL package. And we started with something that looked a bit like this. It, we started with an interface called our client. Um, it provided two methods. A query method, took a request object, and returned back some JSON encoded response and an error. And mutate, which took a request and returned, in this case, an error. We're not, we took a decision there to not care too much about the data that came back from our mutate calls. Generally, we found we didn't care about it. Um, you might do. Um, this turned out to be a really bad idea, and I take full responsibility for doing this interface. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you why in a bit. And we took the query string codes, uh, query strings and from all our different clients and put them basically into one place. I meant that the same query call, for instance, to create a vehicle, or in that case a mutation, we're using the same query string um, no matter which client it was being called from. And we kind of made things a bit better. We created some what we called input structs to represent the variable blocks within the query strings. And then the package exposed some functions that look like this. Uh, they would take the client interface, and they would take any, any arguments we required, populate a request field, and call, the mu in this case, the mutate function, which was hiding a lot of the boilerplate of the transport layer and the stuff that we were showing earlier. Um, and handle any errors, and in the case of queries, potentially decoding the response, JSON, et cetera. 
So at first, it seemed good. Provided an interface for users of the package. Felt like this was quite good from a testing point of view. Um, it reduced the amount of boilerplate that we were doing on our services, and really, kind of the tests we were writing there really kind of didn't have to worry too much about them in our testing as a commentary. We, we, do, we use a lot of mocks and things like that, so we can mock a lot of that behavior. Um, and yeah, it eliminated, eliminated a lot of copy and paste. So yeah, it seemed fine to start with, but the testing was a bit where it really started to let us down, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, slight sidebar to talk about testing in general. Um, you've probably all seen this diagram before. Um, think of it what you will. Uh, testing at human kind of is quite similar to this. We have a lot of Go unit tests, standard unit tests, um, as you probably expect. Um, again, as I said, we've kind of bought into mocking things. Um, I know some people like them, some people not. We then write application tests, which are there for testing a single application, microservice, Lambda, whatever it is. Um, actually compile it, run it, and generally in a Dockerized setup, treating it like a black box um, using a BDD style testing framework. And then we have sets of end-to-end -end and integration tests, um, which we run on the real infrastructure and are designed for testing a subsystem or full system in one go, treating the thing like a black box, acting like the, the input and output data as you'd expect. Um, why have we taken that sidebar? Well, one of the things it, that we've found is like, at what level of stack do we really want to test the integration between our GraphQL clients and our servers? More specifically, as we'll see here, the query strings are quite tightly coupled to the schema. Um, the structure of these is, is very easy to break. If you get the format of that wrong, if you get the type slightly wrong, it doesn't match the schema, your, your query, your mutation is not gonna run. Um, and for us, that was a bit of a problem because often engineers would go in, they want to add a new query mutation into the package, they'd happily code away, they'd write their query string, um, they may or may not have manually tried it, maybe the server-side stuff hadn't been done yet, so maybe it wasn't an option, and then they, you might assume it was done, you then start writing your client code, and it turns out you had a bug, and you kind of have to trace it through into that package to find out where you've gone wrong, and it was quite hard to get a good, kind of reliable set of tests for engineers to say, I've written this package code, and I can be sure that when I use the package in my client, there is not a bug in it when I run it against the schema. It's really hard to come up with a good way of unit testing that. So what about if we try and test it at other levels? Well, this is what an application test harness for human, probably in a lot of other places, look like. We have some application under test. For us, we'd have maybe a Kafka input and output, and then the service itself would be doing some amount of communication with GraphQL. So what options do we have for the GraphQL server there? Um, there's a few. You could mock it. It calls over HTTP, create an HTTP server, and you can stub the responses. You can just give it canned data back that you provide from the test harness. But that still hasn't solved our problem, really. It's, it doesn't provide any validation against the actual schema and stuff like that. So you can go the complete other, up, complete other way you can spin up an AWS provisioned AppSync instance and run it against all of that with all the database backends, et cetera. But that, when you're growing your teams, when you're adding more engineers and more people wanting to kind of um, write GraphQL stuff, test their code, well, you might need to start, start spinning up more and more of those and it starts to become really quite expensive. And it takes time, um, a lot of maintenance, a lot of, uh, in our case, Terraform as well to manage all of that. So your other options are maybe some local GraphQL servers. Um, you know, with using AWS stuff, you, there is AppSync support within local stack. It's quite minimal. Um, or you could look at another GraphQL server implementation. Apollo is one of them. Or even write, write your own. Um, but a lot of that is a lot of maintenance. Again, spinning that up each time you want to run a test. It starts to add time, starts to add latency to your test. Uh, the development cycle is quite slow. So none of that really felt that appealing for us. I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about that side of the testing in a minute, but the, the final kind of testing, the nail in the coffin for that package was how we use it from our client code. We'd expect client code to have a function that looks like this. Um, it's going to take some form of argument. It's going to do a query or a mutation to GraphQL, or a GraphQL package, and then it's going to do something with that. This was an example of a test, a unit test in a client to kind of test that code. Um, there's quite a lot of boilerplate in there. We'd, we'd create some form of mock. I said we're quite brought into mocking. We then have to have this 
get vehicle result object. And this was kind of really horrible. It's actually kind of an implementation deal detail of our graph, the internals of our GraphQL package. Not something we really wanted any of our clients to really have to care about. Like we just tried to hide all of that. And we needed to JSON marshal. And the reason is, is we've, the interface we created exposed the query mutate functions, which were kind of as well implementation details of the package. They weren't really what we wanted to, what you were actually calling on the package, which might be get vehicle or something like that. Um, and therefore, kind of, we didn't really get rid of a lot of the boilerplate as we thought we have. We got rid of kind of like spinning up HTTP servers in your unit tests and that kind of stuff, or HTTP test servers, I should say. But we kind of replaced it with someone else, something else. And maybe for a while, we were a bit naive to thinking we'd done a good job of it. Um, but yeah, it didn't really work as we intended. So how could we improve on this? Well, we first of all want to improve the testing of the GraphQL query strings, and then provide a better interface for our users. So how? Well, we did a bit of thinking about it. One thing that really we've been talking about for a while was we have a schema here, really well defined. It feels like we should be able to generate our Go code from that schema to validate the fact and our query strings in a way that we can be fairly sure that the code we generate exactly matches what our schema is asking for. And it turns out, actually, someone else has had the same idea. There's actually a couple of things out there. And before I go any further, if anyone is involved or maintain this library, kudos to you. It's, we think it's great. Um, definitely want to get involved with helping because, uh, yeah, we're becoming big users of it. And I'll show you why we think it's a really good, good thing. What it provides is it does exactly what I just described. It takes a schema and it takes another file um, which you can use to describe the, what you want or the queries and mutations you're what you want your clients to be able to do against that schema and generates you the Go code. So on the left-hand side, we have our, a basic schema. And on the right-hand side, we have that file describing the behavior of our clients. We run that through the tool, and it creates us code like this. Um, it yeah, kind of looks quite similar to the functions that you probably saw earlier in our package. But this time, and I kind of stubbed it out there, is that, that query string. Um, and we weren't too sure about that to start with. Like, is it doing a jo good job? But we've kind of now re kind of implemented all our queries in that, and it's yet to make a mistake. This gives us a lot of reassurance that when you need to add something new, you can run this code generation tool against your schema. You can create your, your Go code. And when you, you merge that into your package, when you then want to use that in any clients, it's not likely to have many bugs in there. And it's likely to work pretty well first time. Um, and yeah, it hides a lot of the boilerplate. Making the requests, doing the HTTP stuff, really good. Um, we didn't, we, however, we didn't want to use this directly in our clients, so we still maintained a bit of a wrapper. Um, because it didn't completely get rid of the kind of like the interface issues we had from the clients. So yeah, we kind of made a light wrapper around it. Um, this time we created a, a concrete version of our client in our own GraphQL package. It's important in generated code. Um, and yeah, in this case, very simple. It's literally a one-to-one -one mapping between our, our implementation and the generated one. This time though, it's a method on the client. And this is really to yeah, improve that client testing. So we've got a comparison here between the old style test on the left and the new style test on the right. On the right, you can see that the, the testing code is, firstly, it's a lot smaller, but it's a lot easier to tell exactly what the test is expecting, exactly what it's doing. We can see it's doing a call to get vehicle. It's not potentially some other query that is just hidden under that mock to the query. Um, yeah, and we, in this time, we are expecting a concrete type back. We're not expecting some JSON encoded data. Um, and all in all, made, made the testing experience from the clients a lot nicer, a lot neater, and a lot easier to maintain. So what's the code generation? We feel it made our testing and query strings a lot more efficient, a lot less bug, buggy, and a lot less, uh, massively reduced the code cycle for any of our devs. Um, it was an interface to make testing from the clients a lot easier, um, a lot, lot less code, and a lot more focus on the real problem. Um, and we also haven't really gone into it here, but improved our internal package testing using some snapshot style testing as well, which, um, yeah, it's been really effective for tracking down any bugs that we might have got, got in there when you're actually writing the, uh, or potentially, though we haven't found it yet, ge the generated code. So as I said, this is sort of a work in progress for us. Um, where are we at? Well, we've converted all our queries and all our mutations over to the version two of our package. 
Um, we're sort of in the process of implementing as much automation as possible from taking any schema updates, regenerating that Go code, creating the wrappers and all that kind of stuff to reduce time for any of our devs. And we're starting the process of migrating all our clients over to the VT version to try and take as much, get as much uh, value out of that improved testing experience as possible. Always looking for new ways to do it. I kind of skipped over coming back to like the application and end-to-end -end testing. It's somewhere where we kind of don't have a perfect solution. If anyone does have a solution, how you've done it, be interested to know. So, what have we gone through? Taking you through some basic GraphQL. I hope anyone that's never used it gets a sense of what GraphQL is about and how you might be able to use it. Told you a bit about how we use it in our architecture. Um, integrating it with Argo applications and hopefully showing you some of the mistakes and how we're trying to work to improve those. Um, yeah, and if any of that interests you, um, yeah, we're hiring. Come talk to us. If any of you got any ideas about how we can make things better, I'd love to hear them. And um, thanks for listening.